Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. I'm holding in my hand an exact replica of the helicopter I first flew in at age 10. I've loved helicopters ever since. And behind me you see an array of helicopter models, all different configurations. Single rotor, twin rotor, rigid rotor, fully aerobatic. Just an amazing uh, assemblage of aircraft that uh, achieve vertical flight in, in different ways. Rotary wing aviation defined vertical flight from the beginning of the 20th century. But in the 1950s, a very interesting new group of airplanes arrived uh, trying to achieve vertical flight with aircraft in a number of different ways. And we're going to bring that story to you right now. What you see here is an amazing collection of original display models of the experimental designs that were uh, flown in the 1950s, 60s, and on up to today, all on the quest for vertical flight. The Cold War created the need to explore eliminating long runways and large ships to facilitate rapid interception of enemy aircraft and the launching of nuclear strikes. These two aircraft have an amazing place in history. They were designed at the same time period after World War II, first flown in 1953 and 1954, but in different ways. We're going to tell you about that. On the left you have the Convair XFY1 Pogo. On the right, you have the Lockheed XF-V1 Salmon. Y was the designator for Navy uh, aircraft from Convair. V was the designator Navy aircraft from Lockheed. They're similar in some ways and very different in other ways. Uh, the way they were flown was different also. But let's start with the one common denominator that both airplanes had, and that was their power plant. The T-40 concept was two turboprop engines harnessed to a gearbox that drove two 16-foot diameter Aero Products contra-rotating propellers. In concept, it sounded pretty good, but uh, every airplane that uh, used these power plants wound up as an unsuccessful design, ultimately. You had the Douglas Sky Shark, where here you see the engine installation in the uh, XA2D-1. You had the Convair Tradewind, uh, massive four-engine Navy transport, uh, you had the Pogo and the Salmon, as we have here. Uh, there were any number of airplanes that used this. Even the uh, Republic XF-84H Thunder Screech uh, used a, a uh, version of this engine. Almost all the test flights either landed in, in emergencies or uh, just never achieved the performance that the engineers had envisioned for this engine. Other than the power plants, the two airplanes were quite different, and they were flown differently as well. Let's look at the configuration. The Convair airplane uh, is an extension of the delta wings of Convair, but the Pogo was a tail sitter, and the whole idea for both airplanes is that they would uh, not need an airport. As Navy projects, they were envisioned to be shipboard, uh, point defense interceptors, and uh, just would not need a catapult launch. Theoretically, they could land on a platform. Uh, when you think about a pitching deck, if you've seen those videos of helicopters trying to land on a destroyer in a pitching ocean, you can imagine how that would have been for these two. But uh, you go from the delta wing to the stub wing, reminiscent of the Lockheed F-104. Of course, this airplane had the auxiliary fuel tanks and a quad landing gear uh, from the uh, tail section, uh, whereas here you have uh, caster landing gear on the wingtips of the Pogo. Uh, the biggest problem with these two airplanes uh, was getting in and out of it. Both needed massive structures for the pilots to climb these tall ladders and get into the cockpit. And then they were lying on their backs, much like an astronaut in a uh, capsule today. It was very awkward getting in and, of course, in an emergency egress situation, uh, even more troubling. Let's talk about how these airplanes were test flown in the 1950s. The Pogo was first flown in April of 1954. But these were tethered flights in a giant Navy blimp hangar, and uh, that was done so that the airplane would be operating in still air. Then, in August of 1954, at Brown Field near San Diego, a Convair test pilot Skeets Coleman began the actual vertical takeoffs and transitions into horizontal flight and then back into a vertical landing. Uh, he completed 70 VTOL flights, and VTOL, by the way, stands for vertical takeoff and landing. So this airplane went through what they call the full cycle. The problems that Skeets Coleman had to deal with were trying to land the airplane on a spot directly below and out of sight. 
When you look at a normal landing pattern for an airplane or a military 360 overhead pattern, as you see here in this diagram, the pilot has a constant gauge of where he is relative to the touchdown point. He's always looking at the runway and establishing uh, the geometry of the landing. In this case, the landing point is directly below and out of sight, and that poses some very significant problems for both airplanes. But that brings us to the Salmon. The test flights of the Salmon began in December of 1953, but fitted with an experimental conventional gear seen in this photo, the airplane was flown horizontally. It made takeoffs and landings like a regular aircraft. The Salmon did transition to vertical flight in the air. It was able to hover and return to vertical flight from horizontal, but it never took off or landed in a vertical position. The Lockheed test pilot was Herman Fish Salmon, and yes, the airplane was indeed named after him. As powerful as these two airplanes were, the airspeeds were nowhere near pure jet performance. So the maximum speed on the Pogo was 475 miles an hour. The maximum speed on the Salmon a bit faster at 580, but neither were supersonic. And again, just uh, paled in comparison to the jets of that same era. What you see here is an exquisite Convair factory model of the Pogo. Uh, it's made out of wood. It's 148th scale. The canopy is clear plastic, unlike uh, many of the other models where the canopies are painted on. The cockpit is not fully detailed, but it gives you a, a better feel for uh, the real airplane. And as we come around and look at the underside, you'll notice that the uh, flap track fairings are detailed and the decals wrap around each one very perfectly. Uh, you see the landing gear here and the uh, engine air scoops. And then, uh, just like the real airplane, the model has the propellers geared so that they contra-rotate uh, when you turn them. Having looked at unsuccessful turboprop designs, we go to France for a pure jet attempt at vertical flight. What you see here is an amazing aircraft. It's from France, manufactured by Snecma and Nord Aviation. It's the C-450 Coleopter, which in French means beetle or shrouded wing. This is an evolution of the Volant, which was basically a jet engine on landing gear with an ejection seat at the top, which is a proof of concept that the engine was powerful enough to lift the vehicle off the ground. The Coleopter is powered by an 8,200 pound thrust ATAR EV shrouded turbojet. It made its first flight on May 3rd, 1959, uh, with French test pilot Auguste Morel at the controls. It lifted off successfully. It reached a maximum altitude of 2,600 feet. But on a test flight on July 25, 1959, uh, control was lost at altitude, transitioning from horizontal back to vertical flight. And Morel was able to eject from the plummeting airplane, uh, getting out at only 500 feet. He survived, but was badly injured. One of the biggest problems with the Coleopter was that the ejection seat pivoted on its horizontal axis to keep the pilot in a relatively horizontal position, regardless of what the airplane was doing. This created a lot of orientation problems. There were no aerodynamic controls, and the aircraft in flight would actually spin around its vertical axis, like so. So an example of another attempt at achieving vertical flight in an unorthodox manner. Uh, the airplane did fly, but it was not considered successful, and the whole concept of a shrouded jet engine on uh, landing gear was abandoned after the loss of the C-450 in 1959. Although the shrouded turbojet proved unfeasible, Two American designs had a different approach to jet VTOL operations. The first was the Ryan Model 38 shipboard fighter. This beautiful display case is from the factory model shop at Ryan, and inside is the Model 38 concept. This was used to present uh, the idea to the Navy Bureau of Aeronautics, and uh, we're going to turn it upright. Let's open the lid. And you notice the box is painted the same color as the model. And here is the aircraft. A Navy concept for shipboard VTOL and a precursor to the X-13 VertiJet. The Ryan Model 38 uh, bears an amazing resemblance to the Convair Sea Dart. The amazing part of this was the fact that the controls uh, were augmented with vectored thrust. You can see these little uh, uh, openings here on the wing and the idea was that it would blow boundary layer air over the control surfaces to give them more control authority 
uh, when the airplane was actually slowed in a vertical flight. As I turn the model, you can see the, uh, again, resemblance to the sea dart and even the delta wing looking very much like the F-102 and the sea dart as well. But uh, a Navy concept for a shipboard interceptor and uh, it was never put into production, it was never built, but the next step was the Air Force X-13 Vertijet. The Ryan X-13 Vertijet is considered the most successful of all the VTOL experimental concepts of the 1950s. It was a brilliant design. It was powered by a 10,000 pound thrust Rolls-Royce RA-28 Avon engine, the same engine used in the British Comet and French Caravel jet airliners. In addition to the turbojet engine, there was vectored engine thrust through reaction tip jets, which gave the X-13 more control when it was approaching and departing from the launching trailer. The first flights were made on conventional landing gear at Edwards Air Force Base beginning in December 10th, 1955. Chief Ryan test pilot Pete Girard made these flights, and then the airplane transitioned to vertical, and the first full cycle vertical flight was made on April 11th, 1957. These tests were all flown at Edwards South Base. Similar problems to the uh, Convair Pogo and Lockheed Salmon were the pilot visibility on the landing trailer, gauging his position for landing and takeoff, and operationally a very high fuel burn at max power, which gave the airplane a very limited range. Maximum speed was in the 400 to 450 mile per hour area, and amazingly this airplane performed a demonstration in Washington DC by flying across the Potomac River and landing at a parking lot in the Pentagon. Having looked at turbojet VTOL aircraft, here are two American proposals featuring shrouded lift fans for propulsion. The ADD, or Advanced Destroyer Drone, was a larger version of the LALO, which stood for Low Altitude Observation System. Launched from a ship, the drone could seek out enemy submarines and drop depth charges or homing torpedoes. The Convair Model 49. In 1965, the Army called for submissions of an advanced aerial fire support system. It was to provide cover for ground troops during battle. Most aerospace companies responded with advanced helicopter designs, but Convair came up with something totally different. Basically a flying tank, a circular closed wing vehicle that had two three-bladed contra-rotating rotors powered by three Lycoming LTC-48 engines. It was armed with heavy onboard weaponry. Similar to a helicopter, the Model 49 could take off and land vertically but the nose could articulate downward 45 degrees to allow the pilots to see the battlefield. The concept of louvered flight was proven successful in the 1960s with an innovative aircraft that evolved into the British Harrier. The advent of digital design and digital flight control systems in the 1980s allowed vertical flight with a jet aircraft to become possible. The end of the quest for vertical flight uh, really comes down to the Joint Strike Fighter. What you see here are three display models of the JSF. This was a program uh, that created a fly-off competition between the Boeing X-32 and the Lockheed X-35 proof-of-concept prototypes in late 2000. In 2001, Lockheed was selected as the winner of the fly-off competition with the operational F-35. The whole thing about the Joint Strike Fighter is there were three versions of the same airplane and modern technology, digital flight control systems, digital design techniques allowed this to happen for the first time in aviation history, an all-in-one airplane. An easy way to remember the three models is the F-35A, A for Air Force, the runway-based, land-based version, F-35C, Navy version, C for carrier, and the F-35B, the Marine vertical takeoff, and I should say Stovall, S-T-O-V-L, short takeoff and vertical landing. That means that on a ski ramp from an assault carrier, uh, it could launch into battle and then come back and land vertically like a helicopter on the same ship. An amazing airplane, and I was privileged to fly with both the X-32 and the X-35 as my last assignment as an Air Force artist in November and December of 2000. Uh, we chased the X-35 first. Uh, I flew with Simon Hargreaves, who was a Royal Air Force pilot with vast experience in the Hawker Siddeley Harrier and this VTOL experience uh, gave him the capability to evaluate the X-35. 
the way he described it is he said the X-35 was one-third the effort of flying the Harrier. These are the production versions of the Joint Strike Fighter from Boeing and Lockheed. The Boeing uh, aircraft is different than what was proposed in the uh, fly-off competition, which was the X-32, and you can see the difference in these photos. But the F-35 is the world's first supersonic stealth Stovall aircraft. It's powered by a 28,000 pound thrust Pratt & Whitney PW-135 turbofan with a 90 degree vectored exhaust and lift fan system in the forward fuselage. The uh, ordnance is carried in internal weapon bays and the aircraft will be operated by 15 different nations. The maximum speed is Mach 1.6 and this represents the future. It is the latest technology for a tactical military aircraft and again, the two versions of the Joint Strike Fighter, two different ways of achieving the same goal. Just to acknowledge, there's a parallel world of tilt wing and tilt rotor aircraft that we will present in future episodes. Well, there you have it, the complete story of the quest for vertical flight from the helicopter to the Joint Strike Fighter. It's an amazing story of aviation progress, and I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. Until next time, take care.